you can um, show off to all your friends. I gotta try this one because this one is called Main Character. It's a Pinot Noir. Oh, you could eat this pairings, bacon wrapped dates, roasted duck with orange glaze. We got orange chicken. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing, babes. Yeah. And this is how I've been upping my bright sellers game. Okay, do it. Yo. Yeah. That's so elegant. Everything comes personalized to my wine preferences. I honestly give every single box that I've had from bright sellers every single month for like over a year now, five stars out of five. It's super cool because Bright Sellers focuses on finding hidden gems from small vineyards all over the world. Like they work with hundreds of exclusive wine brands. I always get the six bottle box and at least one to two a month go to friends and family as gifts. And honestly, Bright Sellers has more biodynamic wines. The packaging that your wine comes in is completely recyclable, plastic free, and it's the smallest carbon footprint box in the industry. Is this how you can pour wine on a date? No. Cheers. 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 Okay. Mmm, smells good. Oh my mm. gosh. Amazing. Do you, wow. do you taste the lemon zest? Yes. Kinda, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what else do I taste? Rose. Yeah. Yeah, rose. <laughs> Strawberry. Strawberry. Cranberry. It's crisp and dry. Mm -hmm. With notes of ripe citrus and red berries. Damn. Yes. Are we at a Michelin star restaurant right now? <laughs> so make sure to click the link in the description to get 50% off your first bottle of six. Plus, you guys will get a bonus bottle as well as 50% off. So it'll be seven bottles of amazing wine. And thank you, Bright Sellers, for sponsoring today's video. Let's kick this guy out because I need Tiffany's reaction for a second. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Just try one bite of everything. Okay. And you should just be honest. Yes. Okay. Like, you don't have to sugarcoat. You can just say seven out of ten. Moving. On, you yeah. know? Because I'll tell you. Can you let them? <laughs> okay. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Wait, <laughs> so when I. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. So when you. No, I'm kidding. This is orange chicken? No, that's no, not orange this chicken. This is oh. Kung Pao. No, that's not Kung Pao. Are you oh, sure? This is Kung Pao. Dang, he knows his stuff. Oh, it's like Shanghai beef or something. That is. It's like chicken. Does it taste like Shanghai beef? <laughs> hmm. I don't even know what Shanghai beef is. You've never been to Shanghai? <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> Alright, try the orange chicken. So far, like, what's your feeling? Do you feel like your country has been disrespected? Uh. <laughs> no, just be honest. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. Yeah. Like, when I had, first had Penda, I didn't like it. No, I do now. Oh, yeah. It's weird. Look, this is lo mein. I mean, chow mein or whatever. It's... <laughs> what's weird mm -hmm. is it really grows on you. Mm -hmm. You become, you slowly, you will start craving. I'm serious. Really? Yeah. Okay, I was really that. surprised you when I like... just came to America so trying that? those. <laughs> I thought it's a real, real Chinese food. I didn't know there was American Chinese food. Uh, have you tried Korean Chinese food? <laughs> Korean Chinese food? Yeah. There's like Korean chicken. That's our so tangsuyuk. Tang tangsu. Uh, oh, we love tangsuyuk. Tangsu. Yeah. yeah. We have um jampong. Jampong. Seafood. That's haishen. not how it's, <laughs> We just call it jampong. It's really aggressive. Try the noodle. Try the noodle. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried this one? This one's really famous. It's called honey walnut shrimp. I love walnut shrimp. But Ooh, then I don't know if I should give this to you. Thank you. Oh no, okay. Why am I nervous? It's not like I made this food. You this like it? Good. This is good? What's your favorite so far? Favorite what? <laughs> All of them? <laughs> <laughs> favorite what? <laughs> Try the spring roll. It's very different. What? What is it supposed to taste like? Surprisingly good. When we eat out um, at Chinese places, he never orders this. Like rolls. No, not like the... In China, like we eat it differently. We don't eat it this often. Listen, every time my fiance and Tiffany order Chinese food to the house, it's like $200 worth of tripe, woodier mushrooms, and vegetables sauteed that I've never even heard of these vegetables before. <laughs> you guys eat a lot of like... Yeah, varieties. Yeah, like yeah. a lot of veggies, like... I don't even know what they're called. Yeah, like even when I go to the Chinese supermarket, yeah. I, don't, I only know maybe like 10% of the vegetable there. They all look the same but have different names. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to cook those vegetables? <laughs> Can you tell which one's which? Do you know the difference? <laughs> okay. Karagoon? Karagoon's good. So oh. 0 to 10, what do you give? Um, I think the meat, 
they are all very good, but I think the only problem is I like hot food probably mm. like very right away. Not me that too. Good. I like like super hot. But I the do. meat is very soft and stuff. Mm. No. Okay. So zero to ten, what do you give it? Like seven. Mm. Seven. Point five. Wow. Then then what about you? Yeah. Ten, ten out of ten. <laughs> Damn. Wow. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> Anyways, Dan Dan's here because he likes Panda Express 10 out of 10 just like us. So <laughs> we're gonna be, he's like, he's like, are you serious, Tiffany? Let's eat. Cheers, and Dan today, Dan. 10 out of 10. cheers to 10 out of 10. But you know what's not 10 out of 10? Humans. Let's talk about experiments that have almost ended us all. Eat, Dan Dan, oh, please. Oh, shall we? Shall you? Oh, okay. shall we? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about how many times Earth almost imploded? Have you genuinely given it? Because of humans? Yeah. Oh, many times. Like, have you thought about the experiments? Do you know any experiments that killed the planet? Here, you guys take some fried rice. Oh, yeah, there's so many. Uh -huh. Almost killed the planet or killed like, the planet? Almost. Climate change? Yes. Oh, that's not an experiment. Yeah. Uh, oh, like, I'm talking like a human experiment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like what? Like nuclear. Oh, okay, which one? Pollution. Okay. Because we kind of made that, right? I don't okay. know if we were experimenting. You say our existence is the experiment. Mm -hmm. That too. That is, okay. I like it. What else? Yeah, that's about it. Am I missing something? <laughs> is that the right answer? Honestly, we should have been wiped out a long time ago. How are we still here? We will never know. Please stand and eat while I tell you about the times that we almost died. That human existence was almost wiped from the planet. Have you guys heard of the great starfish prime? Oh, wow. I know. Yeah. It sounds like Amazon is shipping you a starfish in cardboard boxes within two day delivery. <laughs> It's actually more terrifying. I know it sounds crazy that it would be, but it is. It's a great example how some super talented, incredibly intelligent people, maybe so smart that it was hindering them. They got together mm -hmm. in a freaking little room and then they almost blew up the planet. So it's gonna be super cool stuff. So let's oversimplify this whole thing because the unsimplified version is gonna put people to sleep, including myself. Let's talk about the Cold War. <laughs> oh. So you learned about it in history and it's like tense times. I remember learning about Starfish Prime, but I guess in school, you're trying to get good grades and you're trying to get the dates right because I don't know why they quiz you on that. They should be quizzing you on the impact of historical events, but they're like, what day did it happen? So um, you're just focused on that, that it just kind of goes over your head. Also, maybe it, it's not taught with the same amount of gravity that it should be. During the Cold War, there was a bit of a nuclear pissing contest. So instead of peeing on each other with your fleets of armies, with your fleets of airplanes, military fighter jets, countries were trying to show off their nuclear hydrogen bombs. Sheesh. So uh, what's new? So in 1961, the USSR was like, Remember how I promised the US and Great Britain that I wouldn't just test nuclear nu weapons for the sh and giggles of it? Mm -hmm. Like we promised all each other that. Like the US said, I'm not gonna do it either. Mm -hmm. The UK was like, ooh, me either. Like we're not gonna do it. Well, the USSR was like, I think I'm gonna do it now. <laughs> it's been enough time, it's been a couple years. It's time to blow some shit up. Like they were getting angsty. They were sitting there like, we gotta, we gotta destroy something. And they did just that. They started testing these bombs, which have you heard of SAR Bomba? Mm -hmm. This is the world's largest nuclear bomb to be detonated in human history. SAR Bomba. Mm -hmm. What the US did sounds, okay, so the US is gonna have like a little thing after SAR Bomba where they're like, well you tested SAR Bomba, so we're gonna do a little testing. And it's gonna sound absolutely dangerous and reckless and flexing, which it was, but SAR Bomba was something else. The bomb weighed like 27 tons. It was built by the USSR and it was the same weight as 10 really big SUV cars, all packed in one. This bomb was as long as a double-decker bus. It's a bomb. It's not a bus. It's a bomb. Holy moly. Yeah. I mean, the gargantuan. It's a nuclear bomb. It's a nuclear bomb. The thing was so gargantuan that a regular Soviet plane couldn't even load it. They had to, and I'm not talking about like a domestic flight plane. I'm talking the military planes. Um. They couldn't load it. The largest one in their fleet couldn't load it. They had to modify the largest plane in the entire Soviet fleet to carry the weapon. And even then, it couldn't be placed inside the plane. It had to be hung underneath the plane. So anyways, 
The bomb was to be exploded in the Arctic Circle over what is now part of Kazakhstan. A pilot was going to deliver the bomb 35,000 feet in the sky. They were going to release it. The bomb would have a parachute. Mm. Okay. Then the bomb with the parachute would slowly fall to about 13 feet thousand feet in the sky which is about 2.4 miles above the planet right and uh, this would give the pilot enough time to escape about 30 miles away from the bomb in the the time that it takes to float down there mm -hmm. 30 miles mm -hmm. before the bomb detonated which is a lot of space if you think about it you know 30 miles yeah that's right? so a long, long time yeah. yeah but even then the pilot only had a 50 50 chance of surviving because the bomb was going to be that f big mm. thankfully he survived. He's a 50-50 chance. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. So thankfully the guy survives and eight of his other crewmates survive. But the blast of Sar Bamba was so strong, it knocked the plane out of the sky. Mm. The plane plummeted to 3,000 feet before the pilot could upright it. And it was insane. Side note, the plane had to be painted white. Do you want to know why? Why? So it could reflect the heat of the freaking blast. The blast was going to be so hot, uh -huh. so strong, that the plane had to be stark white. So who knew about the bomb? You know, was it like secret Soviet testing? They were like, shh, no one's going to know. Who's going to know? No one's going to know. No, it wasn't discreet. The bomb flash could be seen from 600 miles away. What? You could feel the heat of the bomb from 160 miles away. So in a comparison, what would it be like? Like country to which country? 160 miles would still be in Georgia. Would still be in the same state. Oh, really? Yeah, 160 oh. miles. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, but that's like the next... Dang, that's like a couple cities. Yeah, and you feel like <laughs> heat. It's not that you see it. I mean, you could see it from 600 miles away. That's like a separate country. But you still... If it, just depending. think about it. You drive, let's say you drive 60, yeah. files, 60 miles an hour. Okay. That's like two and a half hours of driving distance. Yeah. But you can feel but the in heat. In an instant. Yeah. Oh, you feel hot. Sheesh. So it was over the Arctic Circle. The shock wave over the land that it was exploded upon flattened it bare. Flat. There was it just, nobody. I'm no. assuming it's a, like a deserted yeah. area, right? Mm. But it was completely leveled. Like if there was a little hill, a little speed bump, a little mountain, f***ing leveled. Dang. It was compared to a skating rink after it detonated. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Windows in nearby Finland and Norway, they just shattered. The windows literally burst. Everything within 40 miles of the detonation was vaporized. Oh, Someone who saw it said, clouds were glowing, they were transparent, and then this huge bright orange ball emerged. The ball was powerful and arrogant like Jupiter. Slowly, it silently crept upwards. It broke through the thick layer of the clouds and it kept growing. It seemed to suck the whole earth into it. The spectacle was Fantastic, unreal, supernatural. It sounds really creepy because they're describing a bomb, but I imagine in that moment, it is, it's almost like this eerie silence and you see something that most people will never see in their entire lives, you know, in person at least, and not that we want to, oh, but wow. I imagine it is a very, not magical, surreal. but surreal thing. Because mm -hmm. in that moment, you're not thinking of, we're all gonna die. You're mm -hmm. thinking of, Mm -hmm. What the f is that? I actually know a fun fact. So I watched this documentary. Mm -hmm. It was a couple years ago, okay? But it's about this bomb. It was either this or the atomic bomb. But when you close your eyes, right? Oh, yeah. You can actually see kind of like an x-ray. Like, yeah. I don't know. You can look down and see the bones in your hands. Down. Like an x-ray. Which I think uh, would require... Listen, and I'm taking this very lightly and I shouldn't, but I think that would require heavy amounts of therapy. Like in this moment, yeah. it's like cool fun fact, but like imagine you actually saw your freaking bones. I don't think I, that would be so traumatized. So thankfully that orange ball of essentially fire did not make contact with the earth. It was repelled away by its own force. The giant mushroom cloud that no. this bomb made, yeah. it climbed to the edge of space. It was 40 miles high. It penetrated the freaking stratosphere. Damn. The top of the mushroom cloud was 60 miles wide at the top. 60 miles. So it was in space? Yeah, like, like at the Abbott? edge of space. Wow. The bomb, to give you perspective, it was 1,570 times more powerful than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. 
had the bomb string. One thousand seven hundred. One thousand five hundred seventy times stronger than both of those two bombs combined. What are they doing with that? Yeah. What are they doing? And、uh, the USSR was like, this was tiny test. They were gonna do a stronger test with like a hundred megatons of, yeah. So the US is sitting there like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs>、uh, did you just do that? Did you just? What the f- was that? Okay.、Mm-hmm. So they decided that they were gonna have their own little operation, which technically they said that the purpose of this was to figure out electromagnetic pulses and how they affect the Earth,、mm-hmm. as well as what happens when you <laughs> explode something at high altitudes. Also, like blackout radio communications. I'm sure these were very big reasons on why they decided to carry out these experiments and these explosions. But in reality, a big part of why they started blowing up stuff is like, okay, you know Disneyland,、mm-hmm. how they do the fireworks show at night. Yeah. Sometimes it's for the viewers. Maybe sometimes it's to show Six Flags, Sea World, Universal, that we're better than them. We look at us. We、is、got more. Is? Yeah. Is、we, that a flex? Yeah, we got more firepower than you. Look at that. Look up in the sky, Six Flags. I know you can see it.、Oh. It's to show the competition what they're working with.、Mm, really? We see you, Disney. We see you. So that's what the U.S. is doing. We are essentially the Disneyland. Okay. Some of the rockets that were launched during this time, well, they were wild. So they were near Hawaii, and the first one was Launch Bluegill. Which was not a spacecraft, but a missile. I know some people call it a missile, but I think like the British pronunciation is cooler. Missile. Missile.、Yeah. They call it a missile.、Mm. And they, how do you say? What's the long, real version of lab? What do you call that? Lab. A lab, like science lab. Oh, in French? No, 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 no. the full name, laboratory. Oh, laboratory. Yeah. Laboratory. No, but in、uh, in the UK <laughs> they call it a laboratory. Laboratory. Laboratory.、Ah! Really. I think it's Lab- so cool. Laboratory. <laughs> I want to call. It let、that. me ask you. You know how like in space,、mm-hmm. well,、uh, when you when ast- astronauts are training for space, <laughs> <laughs> during training they have to be in a zero gravity cabinet. <gasps> Mm-hmm. Cabin,、mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Uh, like kind of like G force or what? When they're training, like the astronauts,、oh, they have like they're floating like, thing. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. floating, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're training, but they're not in space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in that cylinder thing, right? What thing? The ones at the malls. Kind of like a skydiving thing, but oh, they're in a tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the wind is blowing right, them on right, them, right, right, right. And they're just like woo, right, in the sky. You think that's how they train? Do you、mm-hmm. see wind blowing when they're like floating in the lab? No,、tube? there's no wind in space. Yes. So how how do you think they're doing it? Don't they just spin like super fast? Spin what super fast? So they're in a in a ball that spins really fast. Yeah. Have you been to Six Flags? Like when they spin really fast, you're just like st- oh yeah, stick to the wall. <laughs> do they don't even put seatbelts on you? You know I tried that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's called G force. So you, th- but the, they're floating. But you're stuck to the wall. They're not、right. stuck into the wall. And you're spit like. Yeah, it's not. No,、good. they're flowing. I didn't flowing. have a good time. No, no. My question is, do you know how they're flowing? flowing. No, I, oh yeah. How? There's no gravity. How? I don't know. Tell me. Do you know? Um. Okay. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> I could sit here and say, Yeah, I know. What's wrong with you? Are you dumb? Are you freaking dumb? I didn't know. I know now, but I'm gonna tell you. I said some dumb <laughs> that I really regret. <laughs> I was like, What are you talking about? Just like put them upside down or something. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you know what? I won't do that. So you, I don't know. I was like, just like put them upside down or something. Um, I also said like just spin them around really fast or something. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sure NASA like does something. Like they have something. So basically,、uh-huh. their training is in the airplane, and the airplane is free falling. No way. Yeah. That's how they create zero gravity. So how do they like fall back up? Yeah, when they get slower, they just they fly just back the up.、Plane. They can do that. Yeah, they, your airplane, you can vroom, climb up. But you're like falling, Lance. Yeah, you're free. You know how tall it is. They yeah, can free、I、fall mean, for a while and then just go up. Is that not so cool? So they're floating in the ce- like they're in the ceiling then. You know how like when sometimes you're in the、uh, elevator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it goes down really、and、fast, you feel like you're, you feel like, you're like yeah. Ooh, you、like、lost your gravity、down. for a second. Oh, so that's how it feels like. Yes. Yeah, so cool. I didn't know that. Shall we try? So basically, the <laughs> crash a plane. You know what I just realized? I'm like, okay, if I were to replace every single person on this earth with just me, clones of me,、yeah. this would be the sh- 
the earth ever because how would I ever think no. to do something like that? That was the question. What if everybody, everyone above the age of eight on earth disappeared tomorrow? What's yeah, gonna happen? Yeah, but you still have smart kids who are gonna grow up to be smart That's adults. That's what you think. Wait, above eight, everyone? Yeah, all gone. So the earth, there's only a seven year old and under, or eight year old and under. Oh, how man. long do you think it will survive? It will, um, it will last like a day. It will be gone. Like yeah, earth will that's go, true. Will be gone. Oh, no, for real though. Yeah. Who's gonna take care of the farm? Who's gonna take care of like, exactly? You know, garbage. Yes, exactly. Like you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It won't even last a day actually. It'll last. So like you're telling me, Earth needs me. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Anyone above age of eight is gone. Uh huh. And then what if you throw one person in, just Stephanie? <laughs> Stephanie and all eight years old. <laughs> oh, that'd be kind of fun. That'd be miserable. That'd be my worst nightmare. You'd be like the teacher. You teach the young. No, people. I'd find one really smart eight-year-old, and I would get down to their level, and I'd say, "So what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think?" You really? <laughs> What's you really your mommy's would. number? <laughs> I'm scared. Wait, the do mom is food? gone now, though. You got some milk or something? I'm hungry. <laughs> okay, okay, I'd be, that would be me. So anyways, the US was like, send that missile up. And while it was up in the air, they're like, hello, blue girl? Are you there, blue girl? They lost radar contact. So they're like, we don't even know where bluegill is. We don't even know if it's staying on the trajectory. Like What's we a bluegill, another bomb? Just a missile. So oh. they're like, we can't explode this missile if we don't know where it is. Like, what if mm. it went off course? So they just, um, yeah, they like cancel it. <laughs> they cancel it. Hashtag cancel bluegill. They abort the mission and it explodes later. They destroy the rocket. That's what I'm trying to say. But do they give up though? No. They said, let's launch Starfish. Starfish goes up in the air a couple days later and promptly decides Starfish is not having it. The engine stops and the rocket starts to break apart by itself. The mission was aborted and the rocket was destroyed in the air. So the second time, it's also failed. Yes. Mm. So What's now they're really feeling uncomfortable like, they're watching us. <laughs> they had Star Bomba. We need to do something. So um, they decide that they're gonna do it one more time. So they decided that it was going to be. Um, oh, which by the way, when Starfish exploded, it was over Johnston Island, which is about 700 miles from Hawaii, and the amount of radiation that it spread was a lot. It was a lot. So did they learn their lesson? No. They took three times. Their time's a charm. They're like, that's, that's what we're going with. They get into Starfish Prime. Now here's the thing with really smart people. They're doing too much and they don't know when to stop. They'll like <laughs> never stop trying. They're like, let's keep going. Let's do it again. We can do better this time. So they launch Starfish Prime, which unfortunately has no relation to the great Optimus Prime. It just means Starfish 2.0. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they launch it, and this time everything goes according to plan. And this one was not just a missile, it was a hydrogen bomb, it was a nuclear bomb. And they were like, blow that shit up, okay? Now imagine someone comes up to them and is like, hey, military, what are you doing? Oh, we're testing to see what happens when you blow shit up in the air. You'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, is it like a simulation or something? Are you like running some numbers? Are you doing like a graph, like a pie chart? No, we're just gonna blow some shit up in the air. Like, that's how they treated Starfish Prime. What do you mean? Like, they are not like treating it with caution? Okay, just a little side note. The space race was just starting between the two countries. You guys know the space race is mm -hmm. the US, the USSR. They're trying to get to space first. They're trying to dominate space, colonize space first. And the sentiment in the US was like, well, if we don't do it, the USSR is gonna do it. Which is not really a sentiment that was shared with the rest of the world, or even American citizens. There were protests in American cities, in Tokyo, to London, in front of US embassies everywhere protesting these open air tests of nuclear bombs. So what I'm trying to say is, the space race is just starting. Nobody really knew what the hell was up in space. I mean, they did, but nobody really worried about sending there. Like this is the era of space junk. Do you know what space junk is? You think you go up there and it's just like fun space? There's a bunch of junk and debris just floating oh, yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. A lot of trash. Yeah. Nowadays. Really? Space no. junk. This was like a huge area era of space junk because everything they were like, send it up. And they were just sending up to space. Just because they could. Like they yeah, just apparently had fun. they just float around because 
you know, yeah. where are they gonna go? They're just offloading. Yeah. <laughs> so if you go to space right now, we will see it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know because I've never really been yet. Oh, you're right, you're right. It's my next trip I have planned. We should go. Maybe, should. yeah, maybe later, end of this yeah. year. We should call NASA. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking like Space Mountain, but. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool too, yeah. So um, nobody was really worried about sending shit up there. They were like, hey, if we can send it, that's the hard part. We'll figure out what the hell to do afterwards, like when we get there. Like this is the hard part. So just to show you how bad crazy everyone was in the 60s, the US had a plan at one point that they thankfully did not go through, but they had a plan to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon. What? Yeah, they were like, when we get to the moon, we're gonna boom. But they wanted like to. Like they're trying to blow it up or just like? No, just to see what will happen if they detonate a just bomb Just the first on the moon. bomb on the moon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Got it, we're the first. Yeah. Type of thing. Okay. Yeah, we're the first. If we don't do it, the <laughs> USSR is gonna do it. <laughs> I see. So uh, that's what we were dealing with in the 60s. I'm just saying, do not give anyone with anything to prove to anybody else the nuclear codes. Too late, here we are. So they launch it, Starfish Prime, at night. It's like 11 p.m. in Hawaii. Pitch black darkness, they send that shit up. And I mean, they weren't hiding it. Everybody knew. The people that could potentially see it, like civilians, they were mainly in Hawaii. And they hosted watch the bomb parties. Photographers were getting ready to take epic shots of the nuclear bomb that was about to detonate in the sky. Now imagine, you're looking through your lens, it's pitch black darkness, and you're like, okay, we need to make sure we can't miss it. What if my camera settings are too bright and I can barely see the burst of light? What if I miss the bomb? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, mm -hmm. they weren't going to. No one was gonna miss the bomb because the US was gonna send up 1.4 megatons up there. They were just gonna, it was a 1.4 megaton bomb. To put it in perspective, it was going to be 500 times as powerful as the one that fell on Hiroshima. Jeez. What about compared to what you just said from USSR? Oh, yeah, this baby bomb. Oh, this is small. But they sent it up real high. So that one was um, 13,000 feet in the air, like 2.5 miles. This nuclear bomb was going off 250 miles in the sky. To put that in perspective, that's where the space station is right now. It exploded and the whole sky lit up in every direction. People who saw it said it looked like noon for as long as 15 minutes after the initial explosion. Do you know what noon looks like? Yeah. That's not like a that's not like a big star in the sky. It's well, bright. the sun is a star, so I guess it is. But it's bright. 15 minutes after the initial explosion, there were these charged particles that collided with other molecules in Earth's atmosphere and it created this artificial aurora. Like the ones that you could see from far away, they could see it from New Zealand, these auroras, no caused by Starfish Prime. Like, like Northern Lights? Yeah, like those type of auroras. Mm. A lot of people said it was scary, but breathtaking. People almost thought like a new sun had showed up in the middle of the sky. The sky looked like it was being lit on fire. There were blood red, pink hues. I mean, it sounds cool, it sounds beautiful. And you're like, but like that can't be that bad, right? Like you've got like a nice little light show. The US gets to flex their nuclear power on the USSR and all's good in the world, right? Yeah. Wrong. How could we be so naive? Well, let me tell you how. Two years before Starfish Prime, America's first satellite was shot up into space. It was called Explorer 1. And while that bis was out there exploring, the scientists were like, whoa, 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 whoa. We used to think out there in space is just like emptiness, like a void of nothing. But we just realized, holy shit, Earth is circled by intense radiation that's held in place by its magnetic field. Mm -hmm. A scientist from, I believe, Iowa discovered this. I, I want to say Iowa. His name was James Van Allen, okay? So they named these donuts of radiation around Earth the Van Allen Belts. Two years before Starfish Prime, NASA was sitting there stressing, worrying. They're like, we just started this space race and oh my god, we didn't even know what happens when we st send stuff into space because it's going to be exposed to a shit ton of radiation, which is a big no-no. Mm -hmm. We know that much at least, okay? This was shocking information back then. Mm -hmm. It really, psh, really was. And I sound sarcastic, but I still think it's shocking information. Like, if you're telling me it's not Guardians of the Galaxy up there, that's wild. 
Anyway, the people <laughs> shooting up Starfish Prime called up our guy Van Allen, uh -huh. and they were like, "Listen, we're trying to f it up." That's okay, right? This is before they blew up the yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah, they were like, "That's fine, right?" Yeah, it's fine. By the way, this is not NASA doing it. This is the U.S. military doing it. Dang. Yeah, so it's not the NASA being like, yeah, I think we're okay. It's like the U.S. being like, hey, Van Allen, can we do it? If not, just remember, we've got like a million troops <laughs> to deploy to your house right now. So he's like, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Well, the bomb set off an electromagnetic pulse that washed out radio stations, set off emergency alarms, sirens. It even caused streetlights in Hawaii to black out. But even more shockingly to everyone, on the Starfish team, Starfish Prime's detonation created a new artificial radiation belt that was stronger and longer lasting than scientists predicted. The Starfish belt lingered for at least 10 years. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. It also destroyed Telstar 1, the first satellite to broadcast to broadcast a live TV signal. It destroyed the UK's first satellite, Aerial 1. Everyone was shocked at how bad it was. It damaged a ton of satellites. I think like handfuls of satellites were victimized by Starfish Prime. I mean, it was so strong that when it blew out, there was widespread telephone outages, electrical surges on planes, radio blackouts. It affected the flow of electricity on Earth. Like, do you even, I don't even know what that, what does that even mean? So like, what good came out of this? Other than peeing on every single country to be like, look at our bombs. Um, it just like kind of proved how reckless we were. I'm assuming in hindsight, any country may or may not have done this. But it's one of those things where maybe I was thinking about it. And then I see someone else do it and fail miserably. And I'm like, can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> So dumb. I can't believe they did that. But like you were thinking about it, weren't you? Yeah, it was probably one of those situations, okay? Well, the bomb released a special tracker. This became a valuable resource for understanding weather patterns now. So that's cool, I guess it was worth it. Mm -hmm. I'm being sarcastic. And the test helped us uh, detect nuclear detonations in space. So the US built a system that could monitor tests in other countries, even the smaller nuclear tests in space, which is like super cool. But also, you know, to be in a position where like, oh my God, we almost f***ed the world up and ended humanity as we know it. You better not try it. We did it, but we're watching you now. If a country did this now, a bomb in that size in space, it would not just be a ton of radiation and satellites going down. More of our lives would be inf impacted because infrastructure now relies heavily on technology. Yeah. Everything is run by small chips that can easily be messed up by a radiation burst like this. Even if it's not a nuclear bomb, something happening in space could easily cause this. Anyways, after Starfish Prime, a Soviet film detector was a Soviet film director was quoted in a paper saying, "We thought in the last moment that in conscience, if not wisdom." Oh, by the way, I feel like I've been confusing atom and hydrogen bombs. They said, "The American atom lovers, we thought they would hear the angry voices of millions of millions of ordinary people on Earth, the voices of mothers and scientists of their own country." But they didn't. Which I mean, just eight months ago, the USSR detonated the largest hydrogen bomb ever called Tsar Bomba. But like, you know, the space race. Which was not a cute thing, by the way. But no worries, because we have now entered into the billionaire space race. At least they don't have the nuclear powers. Or do they? I don't even know what I'm saying, okay? I was supposed to do a scandalous relationship video from Reddit, but like, here we are. Space bombs, space wars, guardians of the galaxy. So a year after Starfish Prime, the US, the UK, and the USSR were like, about that treaty, we should probably sign it again. So uh, they signed a treaty that you cannot test nuclear bombs underwater, in the atmosphere, or in space, essentially. Stop, stop blowing up in the sky. Thank you. And because of that, outer space has been bomb-free since then. Later, it was revised to ban nuclear weapons in all environments except probably one planet, hmm. Uranus. Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. But here's a very scary feeling left from Starfish Prime, that if another country was to do this over 
their rival country. I mean, it could essentially disable an entire nation in one blow. That's freaking terrifying. Did you know the only thing stopping such a thing? Really, I mean, forget the laws and the treaties because yeah, if you're detonating a bomb in space, you're long past laws, treaties, and moratoriums. Like you're like that, who cares about that? The only thing really stopping them is mutually assured destruction. You do that to one nation, you might as well sign the papers on your own destruction. <laughs> That's the only prevention it's right over. now. But who's to say that some leaders might not even care? So yeah, like the Space Force maybe isn't such a funny thing anymore. You know how everyone was making fun of the Space Force? Like, where are you? Can you come pick me up? I'm scared. Also, side note, while the US was doing all the Starfish Prime nonsense, they actually threw a bunch of needles into space. What does that mean? Needles? Yeah, okay, fine. They're called wires, but they look like needles. They look, they're like needles. So the Air Force and the Department of Defense, they envisioned the largest radio antenna in human history. They were scared that the USSR was going to attack sooner or later, and they needed long range communication paths. That's what they needed. Uh -huh. I mean, as long as they had this, because right now everything was relying on over the horizon radios, underwater cables, but that could easily be vulnerable to attacks. So a scientist came up with the idea of having an orbiting ring of copper needles in space to reflect really? radio signals back. Is it just like a one connecting wire? No, it's just a bunch of needles. You want to know how many? Guess how many? How many freaking know, needles? A freaking million? Nah. 10 million. 500 million needles. Jeez. 500 million needles. And like, listen, I'm not fear mongering, by the way. My personal knowledge. I don't even know what needles mean. Yeah, what like it's just like do? copper, it's like, it's like metal. It's like yeah. sharp pieces of metal. And my personal knowledgeable guess is that you're more likely to get slapped across the face by your freaking school principal and share a dinner with Bella Hadid next, and then sleep next to Jack Harlow and a freaking congressman than have one of these needles projectile out of space and hit you. Mm -hmm. But never say never. <laughs> because Jack Harley is just one DM away and your congressman, they're probably a hoe anyway. <laughs> the whole thing was protested all around the world. The freaking Royal Astronomical Society. Um, because space junk, space, space trash, mm. what happens to those needles? 500 million, like fine, let's say half of them work, but eventually they're gonna come back into the atmosphere. They're gonna come back. Are they just floating around? Yeah. They're not connected. The, so they have this gel that causes some of them to lump together. So it's like clumps of needles. Hmm. Clumps of needles. And the Space Force was like, well, they're not gonna come back to Earth. Don't worry. Uh huh. Okay? Until they do? Yeah, don't be a silly goose. <laughs> And guess what happened? It comes. They came back? A lot of them came back. No. And uh, thankfully they're near the poles. They're under piles of snow near the poles. What? But not all of them. Okay. So I, what do you mean? Like they just start falling down from the sky? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and I know people are going to be like, why wouldn't the needles burn on re-entry? Because things burn as they re-enter the atmosphere. Yeah. And I don't know, science, like you call NASA. This is a food channel. I think it's like the angle in which it enters or something, okay? Okay, there's a reason, but there, you don't have to be afraid. The copper needles are not gonna poke you in the eye. But what about the other ones that didn't fall? They're just clumped together in the sky, floating around. There are now perhaps thousands of clusters of clumped needles orbiting Earth and some smaller clumps that are too hard to track because they're too small. They stopped launching needles after that, but uh, that's the story of how the US tried to put a ring around Earth. I put a ring on it. Yeah, and the Earth said, F you. <laughs> and now we have even more space junk orbiting the planet. And that's hmm. it for today's video. Do you guys like videos like this? Because I could do a whole video on Laika. Y'all know Laika? That's the dog that was sent to space. The and US, came back? It was a USSR dog. Did it die? Um, I mean, it's been yeah, a lot for of sure. It. <laughs> yeah. So what it did? What happened was, this is a brief overview. First of all, there's allegations that a different dog was supposed to go into space, but the researchers really liked that dog and they grew attached to it, so they sent the other dog instead. Dang. Yeah, and they lied and said that the dog survived a week in space before being nicely killed, AKA euthanized by poisoned dog food. Why? But it turns out, it turns out the dog did not last a week. In fact, the dog died almost instantly from overheating and stress early on in the trip. But like, oh why did God. they say the dog survived? Huh? What was the reason? I can tell you, but not in this video. So like, beg me for a new one. I'm just kidding. Do it. <laughs> Do it! More space videos! Hopefully I got 
nothing wrong. I want to say like I got 30% of it right. No. 20. No. 10. No. 5. Why are you going lower? <laughs> you're right. You're right. Fact check me in the comments. I might cry. I love you guys and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Make sure to check out Bright Sellers linked in the description. Get 50% off your first bottle of six because, oh, 21 and over though. But chef's kisses. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.